The listening part of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part you will hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a healthcare professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a physician talking to a new patient called Mrs. Delilah. For questions one to twelve, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. Tell me, what seems to be the problem? Doctor, I am a patient of I-131 induced hypothyroidism for the past six years and have gained weight and edema over the last three weeks. Your age? Fifty-seven years. I also have other complications like fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, COPD. And disc disease, as well as the thyroid disorder. Also, my abdominal girth is increasing. Plus, I have increased edema in my legs, doctor. Oh, I see. What medications were you taking? I was on Norvasc and Lisinopril for years for hypertension. I also take Synthroid and thyroid hormone. Do you smoke or drink? No, doctor. I had a hysterectomy and a cholecystectomy surgery two years back, doctor. It seems you're allergic to IV dye, sulfa, NSAIDs, compazine, and Demerol. Yes, doctor. Do any of your close family members have thyroid disease? Yeah, my sister has Hashimoto thyroiditis and Graves' disease. Hmm. It seems you've gained twenty pounds of weight during the past few weeks. Yes, I experience frequent sweats and fatigue as well. Do you feel any chest pain? No, doctor. What about your bowel movements? It is loosened, doctor. Do you have abdominal pain? No, doctor. Your blood pressure shows one forty over seventy, and your heart rate is eighty four and a febrile. You are clinically and biochemically euthyroid. Your TSH is mildly suppressed, but your free T4 is normal, and with your weight gain, I am not going to decrease the dose of levothyroxine. I will continue you on 300 micrograms of Synthroid daily. If you want to lose your weight, then repeat the thyroid function test in six weeks' time to ensure that you are hyperthyroid. Okay, doctor. I need to explain to you a few things about edema. For the optimal functioning of our body, the water content should be about seventy percent. This takes care of regulating our water balance. Our kidneys regulate the water level of our body with the help of the antidiuretic hormone called vasopressin. The pituitary gland secretes the vasopressin to prevent excessive water loss from our kidneys, to hold on the water level to ensure optimal functioning of our body and prevent dehydration. More or less, edema is a symptom of a malfunctioning of water regulation process of our body. Once our body has an adequate water level, and when our kidney excretes water, vasopressin should turn off. However, in the case of edema, vasopressin mechanism malfunctions, and our body continues to retain excess water. Other than medications, what can I do to control edema, doctor? There are certain simple dietary and lifestyle choices I would suggest for you, which can promote healthy elimination of excess water. 
One of the most prominent things you can do is to maximize your water intake through drink and food. Excessive intake of water promotes regular production and expulsion of urine called diuresis. What are all the foods I should eat, doctor? Foods such as celery, grapes, melons, spinach, carrots, and other green leafy vegetables. Similarly, try to reduce the sodium intake in your diet. High sodium always leads to excess retention of water. Beware of canned and processed foods, which are often high in sodium. Foods such as white bread, refined foods, refined sugars, pasta, and even alcohol can result in water retention. Exercise of any kind that increases heart rate is very helpful in promoting the fluid movement from the extremities to the heart, therefore reducing edema in the extremities. Thank you very much, doctor. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. Chattaluka. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Colon Cancer Screening Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Mr. Chattaluka. Please, tell me about your problem. Actually, I was referred for evaluation of colon cancer screening, Doctor. Right. What's your age? 53 years. Do you have any complaints such as diabetes, hypertension, or any other issues? No, Doctor. How is your bowel movement? I get some loosened stools and occasional constipation. Are you under any medication at present? No, doctor. Have you previously had any surgery? Yeah, I had a deviated nasal septum done in 2003, doctor. Are you allergic to any medicines? Not at all. Do you smoke or drink? Yeah, I used to, but for the past four years, I have dropped those habits. Do any of your family members have a history of colon cancer? No, doctor. Any difficulty in swallowing? Nausea or vomiting? No, doctor. I get heartburn occasionally. Okay, that's fine. Here, hmm. Your diagnosis report shows your blood pressure as 111 over 70, weight 215 pounds. Your pulse rate is 69 and respiratory rate is 18. Neck, supple, no thyroid megaly, cardiovascular. Both heart sounds are heard and rhythm is normal. Lungs are clear to percussion and auscultation. The abdomen is soft and non-tender. So, I would suggest you go for a virtual colonoscopy. You might have heard how great colonoscopies are in preventing colon cancer. We normally recommend a colonoscopy after the age of 50. Virtual colonoscopy is an x-ray equipment which is used to diagnose large intestine for any cancer and polyp growths. You should take only clear fluids a day before the diagnosis, and I will give you instructions on how to clear your bowels. You shouldn't eat or drink anything for a few hours before the diagnosis. If you have an allergy to contrast material, I will prescribe medications to reduce the risk of an allergic reaction, which you must take 12 hours prior to the diagnosis. A very small tube will be inserted 2 inches into your rectum to pump air gently into the colon using a handheld squeeze bulb. This would inflate the colon to eliminate any wrinkles or folds that might hide polyps from the view. Thereafter, the table will move through the scanner, and you will be asked to hold your breath for about 15 seconds before changing your positions, a second pass that is made through the scanner. A tube will be removed once the scan is done. The entire diagnosis will usually be completed within 20 minutes. The minimal risks involved in this diagnosis process is that the inflating of the colon with air could injure or perforate the bowel. 
However, this happens in fewer than 1 in 10,000 patients. There's a mild chance of cancer formation from excessive exposure to radiation. Okay, doctor. I think I will go for a colonoscopy. Fine. I have explained the complete process of the colonoscopy with risks involved in the process, especially the risk of hemorrhage, perforation, and infection. Thank you, doctor. That is the end of Part A. Now, look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at question 25. You hear a physician explaining the microlaparoscopic pain mapping procedure to the nurse. Now, read the question. Microlaparoscopic pain mapping. At times, finding the cause for pelvic pain becomes very difficult. This is especially true in the case of pelvic scar tissue, endometriosis, fibroids, and other problems. In a pain mapping procedure, the patient is given some strong medication to make them sleep. After injecting local anesthetic medicine into the navel, the physician will insert a small bubble of gas inside the belly and insert a laparoscope of very tiny diameter inside the belly to look around. Another small instrument is inserted lower down on the belly and used to touch organs inside after the patient awakens. While touching the internal organs, the patient will denote whether the patient is getting pain when touching specific organs. For instance, if the endometriosis is causing pain, it will be tender while touching the organ with the instrument. Moreover, when the patient experiences pain on the right side, it is difficult to make out whether the pain is in the ovary or the appendix. Therefore, pain mapping could help figure this out and help the physician pick the exact procedure. Question 26. You hear a physician discussing the role of vitamin D in lung disease. Now read the question. Doctor, could one kind of lung disease have its roots in vitamin D levels? Interstitial lung disease is an unusual, but at times, deadly form of continuous scarring of lung tissue. A new research by a cardiologist has proved that the condition may be due to low vitamin D levels. Calcifidiol is the biologically active form of vitamin D that is hydroxylated by our kidneys to form calcitrol that circulates as a hormone in the blood playing a major role in regulating the concentration of phosphate and calcium. Its anti-inflammatory effects modulate our immune system and also have antifibrotic effects, regulate various genes involved in fibrosis or scarring. Therefore, if you have the low level of vitamin D, that may be a contributing factor for the lung disease. However, many cases of interstitial lung disease aren't related to any particular factor. Therefore, vitamin D levels may be an unusual risk factor that would be easy to evaluate. New research will focus on correcting the vitamin D levels and in finding out if the condition of the patient resolves or stabilizes. Question 27. You hear a doctor explaining the causes of pyloric stenosis in children. Now, read the question.
Pyloric stenosis. When the muscles and pylorus thicken, that narrows the opening of the pylorus and prevents the food from reaching the intestine. This kind of narrowing of the lower portion of the stomach is known as pyloric stenosis. Typically, this problem occurs in newborn children between two to eight weeks of age. As the pylorus thickens, the stomach opening is blocked. Therefore, the food cannot move into the intestine. This causes a patient with pyloric stenosis to vomit, which could result in several problems. Dehydration is the major problem caused by pyloric stenosis since the regular vomiting devoids the fluids for the nutritional need of the infant. Secondarily, minerals such as potassium and sodium are lost through vomiting, making the baby weak. Mainly, the firstborn male babies are vulnerable to pyloric stenosis. Smoking or intake of tobacco during pregnancy doubles the chance of pyloric stenosis in infants. Bottle feeding is also another cause for developing pyloric stenosis. According to findings, infants giving antibiotics in the first 15 days of their birth have the greatest risk. Question 28. You hear a doctor explaining issues caused by increased testosterone in postmenopausal women. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. Is it essential to measure the testosterone for postmenopausal women? Well, according to research conducted by a cardiologist, higher levels of testosterone in postmenopausal women is the main cause for their cardiovascular disease. Testosterone is a type of hormone known as the androgen in the male. Therefore, a higher level of this hormone in women causes high blood pressure, adverse lipid profile, and other unforeseen health issues. Usually, testosterone becomes more dominant in women after the menopause. However, screening for hormone levels during such health conditions is not in practice at present. Symptoms of an excessive level of testosterone in a female include excess facial and body hair, deepening of the voice, acne, increased muscle mass. Question 29. You hear a doctor discussing the methods to control narcotics use by the patient. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. Is there a comprehensive approach to keeping pain under control, avoiding narcotics? Yes. According to a pain expert who has established a multidisciplinary pain clinic engaging physicians, acupuncturists, massage therapists, psychiatrists, and patients to kick the opioid habit. One fundamental practice followed is signing an actual contract with a patient mentioning that they will not use any kind of narcotic while they are getting prescriptions from us. Moreover, they will also not do anything outside of getting another prescription from any other provider. We will tell them that we will be randomly doing urine examination, and we tell them if they keep getting positive urine tox screens, we are not going to provide them medical services, so then they have to go and find another provider. Occasionally, we get a positive tox screen, and we confront the patients, and we warn them if it happens next time, they cannot come to our clinic anymore. Question 30. You hear a doctor arguing about nose inflammation, whether it is good or bad. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What can the nose inflammation teach us about how the human body repairs itself? We have the ability to smell things because of our olfactory system. However, according to research by an otolaryngologist, 
For the patients with chronic sinusitis, inflammation on overdrive compromises the system. The greatest problem in patients is just the ability to smell due to inflammation, as in the case of chronic sinusitis, for instance. It's evident that chronic inflammation is bad for the olfactory system, at least in the early stages, to begin the repairing process. It is surprising that inflammation actually plays a beneficial role in early repair of tissues that allow us to smell. Therefore, inflammation is a normal and essential process in repairing. But the question is how to regulate inflammation to preserve the good and mitigate the bad. That is the end of Part B. Now, look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear a medical podcast on the causes and issues in leukemia patients. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello, I'm Dr. Gonzalez, and in this podcast, I'm joined by Raman, who is a patient here at the Whittington. Welcome, Raman. Tell me, Raman, tell me something about yourself. I'm Raman. I'm 14 years old. I used to have leukemia. That went on for four and a half years. Can you tell me when it was diagnosed? When I was eight. So tell me something about what it was like to have had leukemia when you were eight for five years. Terrible. I felt that I was very strange because when I lost all my hair, some neighbors used to take the mick, and I was harassed in primary school for it, and that was really a bitter experience. Were you admitted to hospital for a long period? Yeah. How long were you in the hospital? Three and a half years. Fewer healthy white blood cells, platelets, and red blood cells produce the symptoms of leukemia. Based on the speed of growth and the types of cells involved, leukemia is classified into different categories. Moreover, the classification is based on how fast leukemia progresses. You must have had a really terrible time. Doctor, can you explain to me about leukemia? Actually, leukemia is cancer of the body's blood-forming tissues. That includes the lymphatic system and bone marrow. There are different types of leukemia. Certain forms of leukemia are more common in children. Other types of leukemia affect mostly adults. Usually, leukemia involves the white blood cells. In fact, the white blood cells are powerful fighters of infections, and they normally grow and divide in an orderly manner, according to the need of our body. 
However, in leukemia patients, the bone marrow generates abnormal white blood cells that function improperly. It is really very complex to treat leukemia, depending on the type of leukemia and many other factors. However, there are strategies and resources that can help to make a successful treatment. What actually causes leukemia to form? Scientists are yet to identify the cause of leukemia. It appears to develop from a combination of genetic and environmental factors. In general, leukemia occurs when some blood cells get mutated in their DNA, which are the instructions stored inside each cell that guides its action. There may be other alterations in the cells that could contribute to leukemia, which are yet to be identified completely. Certain abnormalities cause the cell to grow and divide more rapidly and gains the ability to live continuously, even when the normal cells would die. Over time, these abnormal cells crowd out healthy blood cells in the bone marrow, resulting in fewer healthy white blood cells, platelets, and red blood cells, producing the symptoms of leukemia. Based on the speed of growth and the types of cells involved, leukemia is classified into different categories. Moreover, the classification is based on how fast leukemia progresses. In acute leukemia, the abnormal blood cells are immature blood cells which cannot function normally, and they have a rapid growth, worsening the disease very quickly. Therefore, acute leukemia requires aggressive, timely treatment. There are many types of chronic leukemias. Certain types of chronic leukemias produce numerous cells, and some produce too few cells. Chronic leukemia targets mature blood cells. These blood cells replicate or accumulate very slowly and can function normally for a certain period of time. Some other types of chronic leukemia produce no early symptoms and become unnoticed or undiagnosed for many years. The second classification is made based on the type of white blood cell affected. Lymphocytic leukemia affects the lymphocytes that form lymphatic tissue that compromises our immune system. Myelogenous leukemia affects the myeloid cells that produce the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelet-producing cells. Doctor, can you explain to me the risk factors involved in this disease? Patients who have received certain types of radiation therapy and chemotherapy for other types of cancers have a high risk of developing certain types of leukemia. Genetic abnormalities also seem to play a prominent role in the formation of leukemia. Genetic disorders such as Down syndrome are vulnerable to leukemia. Exposure to certain chemicals such as benzene used in the chemical industry is connected with an increased risk of certain types of leukemia. Smoking increases the risk of acute myelogenous leukemia. If any family member has been diagnosed with leukemia, then you have an increased risk of leukemia. However, most people with such risk factors do not always get leukemia. Moreover, many people with leukemia have none of these risk factors as well. That is really terrible to know, doctor. Yeah, of course. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the guidelines given by the physician to the nurse about the diagnosis procedure of arthrocentesis. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Arthrocentesis Arthrocentesis, with a subsequent synovial fluid analysis, is performed to determine the cause of arthritis presenting with inflammatory signs or joint effusion to diagnose septic arthritis gram stain, culture insensitivity, or suspected crystal-induced arthritis to differentiate gout from pseudogout. Arthrocentesis can be performed for diagnosis as well as medical treatment of arthritis of a joint. Investigation of joint fluid can help the physician to determine the causes of joint effusion or arthritis, such as gout arthritis, infection, and rheumatoid disease. Arthrocentesis can also be effective in relieving joint swelling and pain. Elimination of synovial fluid from the inflamed joint can also eliminate the white blood cells within, which are the sources of destructive enzymes to the joint. Significantly, arthrocentesis can more rapidly restore the health of the joint. The synovial fluid is analyzed for its physical characteristics, such as viscosity and color, and its chemistry, such as protein, uric acid, and glucose, and microscopy of gram stain, white blood cell counts, and differential count. If the sample is cloudy, there is a chance of bacteria, white blood cells, or crystals present. In the case that the sample is reddish, there may be the presence of blood. Or else, if it's moderately viscous and forms a string longer than 3 cm when a drop is expressed into the test tube called string test. The test mainly depends on the polymerization of hyaluronic acid. A less viscous fluid indicates inflammation. The string test will be negative. That is shorter than 3 cm due to dilution of hyaluronic acid by the presence of extracellular fluid into the inflamed joint. Chemical investigation on synovial fluid includes protein, glucose, and uric acid. Glucose is considerably lower with joint infection and inflammation. There will be an increased level of protein and bacterial infection due to leakiness of the synovial membrane due to inflammation resulting in an increased concentration of plasma proteins. With gout, there will be an increased uric acid. Microscopy Inflammation results in an influx of white blood cells into the synovial tissue. The microscopic investigation is performed to detect red blood cells, white blood cell counts, and differential counts. This will help differentiate the most common causes of inflammatory infusions, joint effusions and septic effusions, hemorrhagic effusions, and non-inflammatory effusions. Septic effusions may be due to fungus, TB, or bacteria. Septic infusions are characterized by physical appearance. Joint fluid will be opaque. Microscopy. White blood cell counts above 2,000 per cubic millimeter and often above 50,000 per cubic millimeter. In bacterial infections, the neutrophil count is usually above 75%. A high lymphocyte count is linked to mysobacterial infection. An eosinophil count above 2% may be associated with Lyme disease. Gout, pseudogout, rheumatoid arthritis may overlap with septic arthritis explained above are inflammatory effusions that are characterized by physical appearance. Joint fluid will be opaque or translucent. White blood cell counts above 2,000 per cubic millimeter, but not as high as septic arthritis. Usually, the neutrophil count will be in the range of 50%. Bacterial cultures and negative gram stain. Polarizing microscopy displays needle-like monosodium urate crystals in gout or calcium pyrophosphate crystals in pseudogout. When gout crystals seen under a polarizing microscope are bryophringent, then they display blue needle-like crystals, parallel to east-west in relation to the polarizing axis, and yellow needle-like crystals when oriented with the north-south polarizing axis. Non-inflammatory or degenerative effusions are caused by degenerative conditions like avascular necrosis, meniscal tear, or osteoarthritis. Degenerative effusions are characterized by the physical appearance of joint fluid will be clear and transparent. A white blood count will be less than 2,000 per microliter per cubic millimeter. Neutrophil above 25%. Avascular necrosis osteoarthritis, and meniscal tears are differentiated clinically. Hemorrhagic effusions Normally, hemorrhagic effusions are caused by trauma. Bleeding disorders such as anticoagulation, hemophilia, 
neoplasms, or neuropathic arthropathy. Hemorrhagic effusions are characterized by the physical appearance of joint fluid will be hemorrhagic, increased red blood cell counts. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.